Okay, welcome back, everybody. I don't have anyone in the uh, Zoom meeting with me now, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today is chapter 25, which is uh, respiratory. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with that. Go ahead and start the PowerPoint and then uh, email me with, with any questions you may have about this. Okay, chapter 25, the respiratory system. This is a great image that shows uh, the various components, major components of the respiratory system, starting from upper respiratory, which goes above the larynx, lower respiratory, everything below. Notice that the left lung has two lobes and the right lobe lung has three. It may have something to do with the fact that the heart is somewhat over on the left side of the thoracic cavity, but there you go. Okay, our body cells continually use oxygen and release carbon dioxide. And the respiratory system is designed for exchange of those gases, bringing oxygen in and CO2 out. The cardiovascular system transports gases in the blood uh, throughout the body once the respiratory system has done its job of exchanging those gases. A failure of either system, which would be respiratory or cardiovascular, leads to rapid cell death from oxygen starvation and eventually the death of the person. Okay, a little bit about the respiratory system anatomy, the nose is the topmost um, part of it. Then the pharynx is the throat region. The larynx is your voice box, your trachea is your windpipe. The bronchi are the divisions of the windpipe. And then the lungs are the terminus of it. Um, talking about where infections would occur, anything, as I mentioned, uh, above the vocal cords is considered an upper respiratory tract infection. Anything below the vocal cords is considered a lower respiratory tract infection. Okay, so this is some of the external nasal structures. Notice that most of your nose is not made out of bone. Only the first approximately one third of it, approximately one third of it. The rest of it is made up of uh, cartilage, elastic cartilage. Now notice the main place that people get piercings in their nose is not cartilage. It's where there's dense fibrous connective tissue. And this is on purpose because cartilage heals relatively slowly. And that dense fibrous connective tissue is going to have more stem cells in it. So getting a piercing there in that white region is uh, more easily healed than getting it done through the cartilage. Okay, skin, nasal bones, and cartilage are lined with mucous membranes, which helps uh, excuse me, warm, moisten, and clean the air by catching dust. The openings of your nose are called the external nares or nostrils. Okay, a little bit more about the structure of the nose. The nose is divided into two main regions. The external nose, which is the root, bridge, dorsum, nasi, and apex, which is this thing that sticks out of our face. Uh, interestingly, that part of our body has nothing really to do with our sense of smell. The part that sticks out does not help you smell. It's the olfactory epithelium, which is on the roof of your um, nasal cavity, is how you smell. Uh, the philtrum is this little indentation. You can't see it because of my mustache, but it's that little indentation there. It's actually the remnant of a cleft palate and cleft lip that we had when we were all fetuses. The external nares or nostrils are bounded laterally by the ale. So these things that you would say your nostrils flared, what you mean is your ale flared. Okay, so this is a cross section of some of the respiratory structures, all very interesting. I'm not going to go through each one, but if you're interested, take a close look. Uh, the nose or nasal cavity, what we're talking about primarily here, is a large chamber within the skull. The roof is made up of the ethmoid bone, and the floor is the hard palate. Internal nares are the openings to the pharynx, so you can see external nares are here and internal nares are here as it leaves the nasal cavity and goes down uh, into the laryngopharynx. The nasal septum is composed of both bone and cartilage and can be damaged uh, by certain diseases and cocaine, believe it or not. The bony swelling or concha are on the lateral walls. You see the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha there that help warm, moisten, and clean incoming air. Okay, what are some of the functions of the nasal structures? Well, the olfactory epithelium gives you your sense of smell. It's about one square inch, much, much less sensitive than that of a dog. We'll get into that later. It's composed of pseudostratified, ciliated, columnar epithelium goblet cells, the goblet cells provide mucus, and that lines the nasal cavity. <clears throat> this uh, system warms the air coming in due to high vascularity, so the warm blood helps 
warm incoming air. Now, why do you want a warm uh, air coming into your respiratory tract? Well, having very cold, dry air hit your lungs and alveoli down at the base of your lungs can cause damage and is, is unpleasant. So having it be warmed by the nasal cavity means it's going to be moist and warm when it reaches the lungs, which gives better gas exchange and less likelihood of damage, especially to the white blood cells that you find on the surface of those uh, alveoli inside of your lungs. The mucus moistens the air and traps dust. <clears throat> and then the cilia moves mucus towards the pharynx. So you have mucus on the inside of your airways. And since dust is sticking to that, and you don't want dust to accumulate, the cilia on the inside of your airways move that mucus upwards into your nose and mouth where you can blow them out or spit them. The pharynx is the section right here where you would call your throat. Extends from the internal nares to the cricoid cartilage, which is the top of your larynx. What are the functions? Well, it's a passageway for both food and air. So that's where both food, beverage, and air passes through. It also forms a resonating chamber for speech production. Now, if you look at it, it looks kind of like a horn, or like a funnel. And that's on purpose. By having that funnel shape, it helps magnify the sound of your vocal cords. And when it comes out of your mouth, it is loud. There's three distinct regions. The nasopharynx, which is right behind your nose. Oropharynx, which is what you would touch if you pushed a swab all the way back to the back of your throat. And the laryngeopharynx, which is just above your vocal. What are some of the cartilages of the larynx? Well, the thyroid cartilage is this thing that sticks out here. What we call the Adam's apple is made up of the thyroid cartilage. Really, the top of your Adam's apple is your hyoid bone, which below that is the thyroid cartilage. The epiglottis is a leaf-shaped piece of elastic cartilage that moves downward as the uh, larynx moves upward to help close the glottis and uh, keep food and beverages out of your lungs. The cricoid cartilage is a ring of cartilage attached to the top of the trachea. That's the another named cartilage just below the thyroid cartilage, but above the regular C-shaped rings of the uh, trachea. So framework of the larynx. And so this is what I was talking about. There's the thyroid cartilage. Named so because the thyroid gland normally sits right on top of it. The top of the thyroid cartilage is the hyoid bone. And then just below it is the cricoid cartilage. And then notice the thyroid, excuse me, the cartilages below it. The cricoid cartilage aren't named. They're just called the tracheal cartilage. If you do a cross section of the larynx, you can see that there are vocal cords and vocal folds. When they when the muscles pull on that, they vibrate. And the way that it works is very similar to the way that sound is produced when you stretch the opening of a balloon, like a latex balloon, and it makes a kind of a buzzing sound as the air comes through. That's very much how you vocal. Okay, true vocal cord contains both skeletal muscle and an elastic ligament, the vocal ligament. It has to be skeletal muscle, by the way, because our ability to produce speech is, is uh, conscious, not subconscious. When approximately 10 intrinsic muscles of the larynx contract, moves the cartilages and stretches the vocal cords tight, uh, causing them to vibrate as the air passes by. When air is pushed past the tight ligament, sound is produced. Longer and thicker vocal cords in males produces a lower pitch of sound. So having a longer, thicker uh, vocal cord gives you a lower pitched voice and having a shorter, thinner vocal cords gives you a higher pitched voice. The tighter the ligament, the higher the pitch. So even with a particular Length and thickness, you can make it tighter, giving a higher pitch, or lower, giving a lower pitch. To increase the volume of the sound, you just push the air harder. The trachea is the airway. It's about five inches long and one inch in diameter. It extends from the, extends from the larynx to the primary bronchi near the lungs, and there are several layers. The innermost layer is called the mucosa, and is composed of pseudo-stratified columnar epithelium the cilia, and goblet cells. Remember, the goblet cells are pr to produce mucus. The submucosa is composed of loose connective tissue, seromucous glands found just below the epithelium. And then the sublayer is the hyaline cartilage, which is somewhere between 16 and 20 incomplete rings. The question is, why are they incomplete? Well, they're shaped like the letter C. Why not go all the way around? Well, why have them in the first place? Well, the reason why we need uh, <clears throat> cartilage in our airway is so that when we breathe in, the pressure doesn't collapse the tube and keep air from coming in. So why are they C-shaped? By, by having them incomplete, the backside is right where your esophagus is, 
it gives a little bit of space for the food to pass and actually bulge, the esophagus bulges into the airway slightly as you swallow um, your food. So it's kind of a way to do double duty with that same space. Okay, these are the trachea and bronchial tree. You can see that the primary bronchi are the main divisions here, and then the secondary bronchi and tertiary bronchi are as they divide further and further. The full extent of the airways is visible starting at the larynx and trachea. Uh, don't worry about this. This will not be on your final. Okay, this is a scanning visual image of a uh, regular light micrograph of the respiratory airway epithelium. You can see the cilia. You can see the goblet cells that are producing mucus. And you can see the epithelial cells that support it. The ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells with goblet cells produce a moving mass of mucus. So as that mucus sits on the surface with a little bit of saline underneath, it moves the mucus that contains dust that you've breathed in towards the nose and mouth so you can breathe. Okay, a little bit of the histology of the bronchial tree. The epithelium changes from pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium the non-ciliated simple cuboidal epithelium as it passes deeper into the lungs. So you lose those cilia as you move deeper. <coughs> Hope you'll excuse me, I have a little bit of a cough today. The incomplete rings of cartilage are replaced by rings of smooth muscle and then of connective tissue as you move from the trachea down into the bronchioles. The adrenal gland releases epinephrine, which is a hormone that relaxes smooth muscle and dilates the airways. This helps you breathe more deeply. An asthma attack or allergic reactions constrict the distal bronchial smooth muscles, making the airways narrower, more difficult to move air, more difficult to breathe. In nebulization therapy, you inhale a mist that contains chemicals that relax the muscle and reduce the thickness of the mucus. Now, these inhalers, or rescue inhalers are there to relax that smooth muscle so the airways can expand and you can get more air coming in. So this shows you the pleural membranes in purple and what it would look like in actual cadaver. The visceral pleura covers the lungs. Remember that term visceral means covering the organ itself or organs. And the parietal pleura covers the inside of the cavity. So you have two membranes with a little bit of fluid in between. The pleural cavity is a potential space between the ribs and the lungs. Why do we say a potential space? Well, the ribs and lungs stick together very, very closely, tightly, with a little bit of liquid in between. But if you have a collapsed lung, it could separate, leaving an actual cavity in that space. <clears throat> okay, structures within a lobule of the lung. So this is a lung, and if you move down towards the terminus of it, you can see we have terminal bronchioles, then eventually these alveoli, which is Latin. Italian for a grape cluster, and that's why it's named now. So this is where gas exchange actually occurs. <coughs> Branchings of a single arterial, venule and bronchial, are wrapped by elastic connect, excuse me, wrapped by elastic connective tissue. In a respiratory bronchial, alveolar ducts are surrounded by alveolar sacs and the alveoli, which as I said, are the sites of gas exchange. So the only place that oxygen comes into the body, only place the CO2 leaves the body is right here in these alveoli. Everywhere else, the gases stay within the blood, except, of course, as they move into the tissue. We're talking from the environment. Okay, if you look at a cross section of the lungs, it looks mostly empty, and that's because it is mostly empty. These are the alveoli, they're basically like balls or balloons filled with air and blood surrounds that, giving gas exchange. Okay, the scientific term for breathing is pulmonary ventilation. Air moves into the lungs when the pressure inside the lungs is less than atmospheric pressure. Some people tell me that that is counterintuitive, but when you reduce pressure, air always goes from high pressure to low. So if there's low pressure in your lungs, you expand your lungs, air is gonna rush in because there's more space to fill. Exhalation is when you compress your lungs, pushing the air out. Air always goes from high pressure to low. So you generate low pressure in your chest by inhaling, expanding the chest, air rushes in. Air moves out of the lungs when pressure inside the lungs is greater than atmospheric pressure. And the way to think about this is, 
the pressure inside the tires of your car is much higher than atmospheric pressure. When you make a hole in your tires, which way does the air go? It goes from inside your tire out. This air always goes from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. Atmospheric pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury, and at sea level, it is 700 millimeters of mercury, just the way that it's measured. Okay, so how does this work? How, does, how do you expand the test cavity? Well, if you think about it, your ribs are set up kind of like a bucket handle. And as the bucket handle lays flat, there's no space in between the handle and the bucket. But as you raise the handle up, the space increases, and now you have a larger cavity. Now, a larger cavity has more room for air to be inside of it, so air rushes in. Your ribs are set up very much like a bucket handle, so when they swing upward during inhalation, air rushes in, and when they move downward during exhalation, air moves out. Breathing in requires muscular activity and chest size changes, increasing chest volume. Contraction of the diaphragm flattens the dome and increases the vertical dimension of the chest. So not only are your ribs kind of raising up like this, but your diaphragm when relaxes like this and it flattens when contracted, also increasing the volume of your chest cavity, giving more room for the air to rush in as part of inhalation. Okay, so inhalation and exhalation. Okay, quiet inspiration as we would be breathing if we were not running or trying to blow out a balloon or coming up from the air for air. You can see the muscles of inspiration are the external intercostals and diaphragm, and the muscles of expiration are the internal intercostals and the external oblique, internal oblique, rectus abdominis, and transverse abdominis. So these muscles, expiration, breathing out, and these are the main muscles of breathing in. The diap diaphragm moves about one centimeter, which is a very small amount, and then the ribs are lifted by the muscle. You can see they're pulling upward. Intrathoracic pressure, that means the pressure in your chest, falls, and then approximately two to three liters of air are inhaled. This is inspiration. In quiet expiration, it's passive. It means that you just relax everything, and normally the ribs will fall, the diaphragm will rise, and so breathing out is really a passive process. Elastic recoil of the alveoli and the lungs and surface tension within the alveoli and lungs pulls everything inward, contracting it, pushing it. Alveolar pressure increases and air is pushed out. Labored breathing, that means if you're breathing hard in like or breathing out, that means forced inhalation or exhalation. In forced expiration, the abdominal muscles, MM means muscles, force the diaphragm upward. So you press your diaphragm, pushing your diaphragm, excuse me, you contract your abdominal muscles, that pushes your diaphragm upward and pushes the air up and out. Internal intercostals depress the ribs, so you pull your ribs downward also to decrease the volume. In forced inspiration, the sternocleidomastoid, which is the muscle that runs from the bottom of your skull down to the front of your neck. The scalenes and pectoralis minor, which is the muscle just above your pec major, Lift the chest upwards as you gasp for air, increasing the volume. Okay, so this shows you a summary of how breathing works. Take a look at it. That's basically what I just told you. Alveolar pressure decreases, air rushes in. Alveolar pressure increases, air rushes out. Maybe counterintuitive, that's how it works. Alveolar surface tension. Now, you may have heard of a thing called surface tension before. It's the Tension formed by water molecules being attracted to each other. A thin layer of fluid in the alveoli causes inwardly directed force, which is called surface tension. That's due to the fact that water molecules are strongly attracted to each other and tend to pull inward. This causes the alveoli to remain as small as possible. Well, you don't want that surface tension causing the sides to touch and stick. So there are cells within the alveoli that create a detergent-like substance called surfactant. And this lowers alveolar surface tension, reduces the desire of the lungs to shrink, and reduces the ability or inclination of the lung surfaces to stick to each other and not be able to fill with air. Pneumothorax. Pneumo means air, thorax means chest. Now, normally, yes, you do have air in your chest, but you don't want air between the lungs and the ribs. That's supposed to be stuck together very tightly, suction cup. The pleural cavities are sealed cavities, not open to the outside. So there's air in your lungs and air outside your chest, but not supposed to be between those layers. 
Injuries to the chest wall that let air enter the intrapleural space cause what is called a pneumothorax. And that can cause a collapsed lung on the same side as the injury because the lungs want to collapse and as long as the lungs aren't stuck to the ribs like a suction cup. Remember, a suction, a suction cup will fall if you let air under the suction cup by lifting the edge. So the only reason why your lungs expand out, believe it or not, is because they're stuck like a suction cup to the inside of your ribs. If you allow air into that space in the same way a suction cup falls, your lungs would collapse and you can't forcefully fill them with air because it's a, it's a suction process, not a push process. Okay. That is the end of this chapter. And so since there's no one here to ask questions, I hope that you guys will ask questions if you have any. Best of luck with this week's work, and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys.